delighted to be here with you today to celebrate our three honorees. And before we get started, I do have a few remarks to make. First of all, for those who are new, I want to tell you a bit about Gotham. Gotham Green is one of 45 subgroups of Gotham City Networking, which is a business and social networking organization whose motto is, it's better to give than to receive, and what goes around comes around. My name is Gail Colin, and I am co-chair with Fred Klein of Gotham Green. And Gotham Green specifically focuses on the green business sector, and our members all either have green businesses, work for one, are interested in green uh, businesses, or something along those lines. In 2008, we wanted to do something to raise awareness about the green business sector, both within Gotham and in the New York City community, metropolitan area. So we created the Gotham Green Awards as a way to recognize some of the outstanding green organizations in our area. Okay, I'd like to give Fred the chance to say a few words then. Bear with me because I'm shy. <laughs> As Gail said, um, our main credo is it's better to give than receive, but what goes around comes around, and Kelly Wells has coined the irrational acts of kindness. Um, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here today to see this idea take root, germinate, and come to fruition. It, it, Gail came up to me in a diner in Queens over a year ago and said, not in these words, are you down for a green group? And I'm down for it. I mean, it, it, was, it was just a, you know, a natural idea, and uh, I sort of euphemistically coined that it's the Save the World group. And if every city and every uh, you know, little hamlet had a green group, uh, I think uh, things would be a lot better. Save the World group. And the people that have gravitated to the group are just the finest, most giving and caring people, much different than the people in other groups. Not, not to disparage the people in other groups, but Gotham is a social-business networking group, and the emphasis on the social is really what's important. Um, and I just want to tell you, to, to prove that we, uh, so to speak, put the money, our money where the, our mouth is, we put all this stuff together at my office, and somebody said, we'll take a cab. And Gail said, no, we're all going to walk over with it. So we, 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 did, we did the right thing. Um, three and a half. Uh, a, a, a couple of things. Gotham is 12 years old. I'm going to just hand around uh, the Gotham Journal from our 10th anniversary gala, and it gives you a slice of Gotham. And I'm not going to take much more time up. And I know this is counterintuitive to the Green Group, but we have some paper brochures for the Gotham Gol uh, golf outing, which is on June 1st. Please take it only if you're interested. Um, and it's our best networking event. But I hope to get them all back, or you know, people are going to participate. Um, I really, that's really all for now, Gail. Thank you. The ultimate goal, I think, and I think other people may agree, of the green movement is to make ourselves obsolete. To get to the point where when you build a building, it's green. And the story. Is that to hear on tape the sound of the extinct Hawaiian nene goose, did I get that right? Nene goose? <laughs> um, is a novelty indeed. And where everyone has a green collar job because every business is a green business. I hope our children and grandchildren live to see that day. And in that spirit, I'd like to uh, introduce who our honorees are, and then uh, we will be presenting them with awards, and each honoree has their own special presentation for us. So, um, in the green business category, our honoree is Green Street Construction, represented by its president, Robert Pollitzer. Our, our Green Business Initiative is the Ear to the Earth Network, which is part of the Electronic Music Foundation. And today representing them is the Executive Director, Joel Chatterby. 
then in the green community-based organization category is Sustainable South Bronx, represented by their executive director, McKellar Crater. So our first presenter today is Mark Halpert, who is the chair of Gotham New Haven. He is also the founder of Your Best Interest LLC and eGiving, and he's also the person who nominated uh, Green Street Construction for the Green Business category. Everyone, please welcome Mark. Those of you who have kids always know that there's always a question a kid asks, and that is, my kids always ask me on Father's Day, it's nice to have a day for Father's Day, but when is it Children's Day? Mm -hmm. And I always think a minute, and then I say to them, every day is Children's Day. I guess that's politically correct. Yesterday was Earth Day. It was the 39th Earth Day. Some of us remember the first Earth Day. We're still penetrating to try to get the idea behind Earth Day going. What's really interesting about the people today, and especially Robert, is that for them, every day is Earth Day. So I want to make this presentation. So I'm really pleased to have nominated and to be able to present this uh, Gotham's first Green Business Award to Green Street Construction and Robert Politzer. Uh, just on a personal note, I met Robert about a year ago in this very building uh, at a green luncheon. I was uh, riding the circuit from Connecticut to the Green Group. And in about a day's time, he contacted me and said, we've got to start a Green Group in Connecticut. Uh, we worked really closely, and it was a great, cohesive uh, effort. However, we just weren't able to sustain enough members to keep it going, but it's asleep, it's not dead. So if you know green people in Connecticut who would like to get involved with a, another Gotham group, I've got the time, I've got the effort, um, and we'll get it going again. But at one of our green meetings in Connecticut, Robert made a presentation to us about his company's capabilities, and I was just uh, humbled. Yeah. I had never seen anything like it. It really opened my eyes. Uh, it was just a great presentation. So, getting to know him and knowing the quality and the pride he takes in his work, the level of sophistication, the technical caliber of his buildings, the low-key character that this firm has, and I visited the firm in its headquarters, met his colleagues, met his staff. It's a very unassuming office in Harlem. It was a great day that I had with them, working with them. Uh, and now they're going to turn their payments into paperless payments which is what I'm all about, and they're all about. So they really walk the walk, and they talk the talk. It's really important. Just as a very, very brief overview of a taste of the type of work they do, they do renovation of homes and historic buildings, new construction, consultation and training of subcontractors, designing and building, and energy audits. Um, for their work, they've been, uh, their work is designed to uh, reduce our carbon footprint, save money on increasing energy bills and improve the healthiness and really the aesthetic beauty at the same time of all the built environments. So Earth Day is every day for them, for the people that live and work in their buildings for decades to come, based upon their great work. Their, Gotham's not the only group to award Green Street for their work. They've been awarded by the USLBA, the 2008 New York Award for the construction categories, and Green Opie awarded them their Distinguished Business Award for 2008-2009 for their commitment to sustainability. So now we're going to add to that list of, of awards, and I'm really pleased to have nominated them, and to present them with the Green Business Award today. In addition to the Green Business Award, we're also going to present Robert a certificate that says that the Arbor Day Foundation's Rainforest Rescue Program will save 12,500 square feet of tropical rainforest in their name. So it's not just a piece of paper, it's a lot of doing good that we're going to give him today. So help me congratulate Robert on this award. And this one was designed by Josh Sinder, our one of our uh, members who's a green designer. What color is the ink? <laughs> the pen we signed with green ink. One, two, three.
This is our uh, amended version of the Village Green Show that we're hoping to do uh, long term. So, uh, about a couple of years ago, my daughter introduced me to to uh, a video called The Story of Stuff. If you haven't heard it or seen this, it's really remarkable. Uh, about a 20 minute video, you can find it online. I want to show you about two to two and a half minutes. This woman, Annie Leonard, has done a beautiful job at explaining where we're at and where we need to go. Do you have one of these? I got a little obsessed with mine. In fact, I got a little obsessed with all my stuff. Have you ever wondered where all the stuff we buy comes from and where it goes when we throw it out? I couldn't stop wondering about that, so I looked it up. And what the textbook said is that stuff moves through a system from extraction to production to distribution to consumption to disposal. All together, it's called the materials economy. Well, I looked into it a little bit more. In fact, I spent 10 years traveling the world, tracking where our stuff comes from and where it goes. And you know what I found out? That is not the whole story. There is a lot missing from this explanation. For one thing, this system looks like it's fine. No problem. But the truth is, it's a system in crisis. And the reason it's a system in crisis is it's a linear system and we live on a finite planet. And you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. Every step along the way, this system is interacting with the real world. In real life, it's not happening on a blank white page. It's interacting with societies, cultures, economies, the environment. And all along the way, it's bumping up against limits. Limits we don't see here because the diagram is incomplete. So let's go back through. Let's fill in some of the blanks and see what's missing. Well, one of the most important things that's missing is people. Yes, people. People live and work all along this system. And some people in this system matter a little more than others. Some have a little more say. Who are they? Well, let's start with the government. Now, my friends tell me I should use a tank to symbolize the government, and that's true in many countries and increasingly in our own. After all, more than 50% of our federal tax money is now going to the military. But I'm using a person to symbolize the government because I hold true to the vision and values that government should be of the people, by the people, for the people. It's the government's job to watch out for us, to take care of us. That's their job. Then along came the corporation. Now the reason the corporation looks bigger than the government is that the corporation is bigger than the government. Of the 100 largest economies on earth now, 51 are corporations. And as the corporation has grown in size and power, we've seen a little change in the government where they're a little more concerned in making sure everything's working out for those guys than for us. Okay, so let's see what else is missing from this picture. We'll start with extraction which is a fancy word for natural resource exploitation, which is a fancy word for trashing the planet. What this looks like is we chop down the trees, we blow up mountains to get the metals inside, we use up all the water, and we wipe out the animals. So here, we are running up against our first limit. We are running out of resources. We are using too much stuff. Now, I know this can be hard to hear, but it's the truth, so we've got to deal with it. In the past three decades alone, one-third of the planet's natural resource base has been consumed. Gone. We are cutting and mining and hauling and trashing the place so fast that we're undermining the planet's very ability for people to live here. Where I live, in the United States, we have less than 4% of our original forests left. 40% of the waterways have become undrinkable. And our problem is not just that we're using too much stuff, but we're using more than our share. We have 5% of the world's population, but we're using 30% of the world's resources and creating 30% of the world's waste. If everybody consumed at US rates, we would need three to five planets. And you know what? We've only got one. So you'll have to go on the internet to see the whole thing. It's truly remarkable, uh, brilliant piece. So the lesson for today at Village Green is a lesson of integration. Uh, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, of course, we've got to start with where we're at. We've got to begin by making our cities and where we live ex much more energy efficient. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the mayor and council speaker just um, pushed a series of proposals meant to make existing buildings more energy efficient in the city of New York. It's a very promising um, set of legislation they're pushing. Of course, after we get our buildings much more energy efficient, we need to power them in a sustainable manner with wind and, and, and other uh, renewable energy sources. And just the other day, 
Our great president, I'm happy to say, Barack Obama, announced a plan to lease federal waters for clean energy. What a concept, right? But the best news of all, uh, uh, that um, I, I saw this today, the Times, an open letter on progress. Uh, has progress taken us to a better place? I'd say it's taken us for a ride. Honestly, what thanks to we owe progress? We're up to our necks in landfill, down to the wire on resources, and climate change is out to get us. Our, uh, uh, or, at best, leave us with a nasty sunburn. That's why progress plays no role on the post-shredded wheat company. So it turns out that post-shredded wheat is the secret to our sustainability, folks. I just thought you'd to know that. Uh, but, uh, next one. In my realm, in the building realm, when we talk about integration, we talk about integrating design, engineering, construction, and finance such that everybody is working together, hopefully collaboratively, and working in a very, very well-run team. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. This is a project we worked on. I won't name names, but uh, this was all kinds of problems. Not enough money. The architect uh, didn't finish the plans until a year into the project. New owners were brought on board. The project was shut down for a while. Uh, as they say in Yiddish, oi, oi is about the best oi vey for this project. It was a real disaster because we did not have the integration. Um, we did get through it, but it could have been done much quicker, easier. And in fact, the point is this. When you do not properly integrate a building project, it will cost you money. So it costs a lot, in fact. It costs even more to not have a very well executed integrated design team. And that being said, we got another song in mind, yeah?
trouble saying words today. <laughs> um, our wonderful Fred Klein. Thank you, Fred. Good plan. The reason I said I was uh, nervous before is that my son Alex, uh, Gotham's uh, creative director, is here, and uh, he was really enjoying the music. And I, I just want you to send a message uh, to Pete that, to me, he was the John Lennon of the Weavers. <laughs> yeah. None of you except Mike Appel even remember the Weavers. Um, the very first time uh, that uh, my good friend and uh, Gotham Green member, Lou Tessa, introduced me to Joel, um, I discerned a twinkle in his eye. Uh, I think that's very characteristic of you. And uh, people say that uh, the eyes are the window into the mind. Well, uh, there's a star in there. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, I googled uh, Paul, I'm a little prepared, and um, nah, Joel, Paul. I was, I, was, I was worried whether it was going to be John Lennon or, or Paul McCarthy, so that's where Paul is running around there. I googled Joel, and uh, of all the people in Gotham, he has the most pages I've ever seen. And I'm sorry that I never showed you the respect that you warrant, but your twinkle is so disarming. That, uh, but he, he really is uh, an amazing person, and uh, it's a testimonial to you that you, know, you don't act uh, like a uh, big shot. And, it's, and you are a big shot. Uh, he's a composer, he's an author, he's uh, an internationally recognized pioneer in the development of interactive uh, music systems. And when you, when you boil it down to networking, the essence of networking, and something that I'm not as good at as others, is listening. If you listen, you can really learn. It's one of the most overlooked and, uh, and underheralded aspects. And his foundation says, indeed, by listening to the sounds of the world, you're listening to the state of the world. And, and one of the things they do is that they record and play natural sound. Dinosaurs, everyday radiation, Zion water, seismic vibrations of the Eiffel Tower. And, and the, the reason that I think he's nice to me, independently, I had the inspiration in 2006 um, at sundown to record the sound, the primeval sound, sound of the spring peepers over my pond. And I played it for him, and you know, he, he, I think you were impressed. I think you were genuinely impressed. Uh, so he really is somebody that is, you know, when they send the next spaceship out there into the greater reaches, your sounds are going to be on that spaceship. So I'm honored to present Gotham's first annual Green Initiative Award to the Electronic Music Foundation's Ear to the Earth Network Executive Director, Joel, not Paul, Chatterby. <laughs> the donation for the rainforest was also made in the name of the Electronic Music Foundation. <clears throat> Oh, Fred, thank you. Thank you very much. I, that's a wonderful introduction. I just want to mention that um, when I listened to Fred's recording of the peepers in his backyard, I did find one very serious. I did have criticism, uh, which is that it was far too short. And ever since then, uh, you know, sounds of the environment are wonderful when they're two hours long, three hours long, and so on, when you really get a sense of the way something uh, develops. And ever since then, I've really been trying to taught Fred into becoming more professional in recording, in field recording, and so on. I'm still kind of working, working at it, so I hope, hope that he will join, join our ranks fairly soon. I'd like to um, maybe start, in fact, by telling you about one of the current projects of projects within the general um, range of projects of uh, Year to the Earth, which is called New York Soundscape. And I think of this right away because of uh, Fred's uh, co potential cooperation um, in the project. But the idea is not only that by listening to the world, 
sounds of the world, we're listening to the state of the world, but it's, in the case of New York Soundscape, it's what happens when your grandchildren ask you, what did New York sound like in the age of internal combustion engines? <laughs> and so we thought that what we wanted to do was to make uh, a sound resource of New York. For one thing, it tells us a lot about the city. For another thing, our goal is really to enlist people that are not necessarily professionals, that have stories to tell, and that will illustrate their stories in sound, so that we get all kinds of sounds. Sounds not necessarily located to specific places, like the corner of 23rd Street and 5th Avenue, but sounds that are specific to different people, to the way they live in New York, and so on. I must say that as a musician, if I knew what Salzburg sounded like in the age of Mozart, I would satisfy a very great curiosity. And I think that it would be wonderful for all of us to hear his voice, uh, for example. But the means for gathering together and making these kinds of recordings are very inexpensive and very technically excellent. Um, now, field reporters are just, I mean, I think every 16-year-old has something like that in the, um, the iPhone coming up. Recording is becoming uh, ubiquitous, in fact, kind of dangerous to have people walking around recording every time I want to be a little bit careful about that. The, uh, so New York Soundscape is, is a major project that we're interested in. We also view it as a social experiment in involving people, and we also uh, view it as an archive. And we also see the educational value in it. For example, when a, if a student goes out and records some theme related, for example, to pollution, are they learning about pollution by making a digital artwork about it? I would say yes. I would say that this is really a very interesting crossover between, between education and between um, uh, art. That with these resources in art, with the ability to record and to evaluate what it is that we've recorded, we really are opening up an entire new function for art, which I find in itself to be extremely fascinating. But I would like to respond also to other questions that I'm often asked, namely, what is environmental sound? And we're um, too used to watching pictures of the environment, for example, glaciers of the Antarctica accompanied by string orchestras playing some kind of super music, which is a little bit ridiculous in that it doesn't, it takes away from the experience of looking at Antarctica. And there are many people in the world, there are many sound artists who are very interested in traveling to places like Antarctica and the Arctic and so on to actually record the sounds. And hearing those sounds does give you much more an impression of being there than not, than not hearing hearing this from the orchestra play while well, you just view, view what it is. In fact, we were listening practically all the time. According to a scientist friend of mine, there's only, there are only a few minutes each night when we're actually not listening in, in a certain sleep mode. But for the rest of the time, we are always listening. We're listening 360 degrees. We're listening all around us. We may be paying attention to one item within a certain soundscape. But as soon as we hear something else that's anomalous, we turn around and look for more, for more information. Listening is our first method of reacting to the environment, and it's listening that gives us many cues as to how we interpret what it is that we see. I'd like to give some examples of environmental sounds for you and introduce you to uh, Bernie Krauss, who incidentally replaced Pete Seeger in The Weavers. <laughs> and then had some kind of a major turn in his career when he decided to spend the rest of his life recording sounds. So Bernie, in the first sound, Bernie was in the Amazon. And I'm also going to introduce you to the most charming jaguar you've ever heard. One night while recording at a location in the Amazon basin, my colleague Ruth Happel and I became aware of the unmistakable scent of the nearby jaguar. We were alone in the forest, some distance from our campsite, and we never heard or saw it. At one point, we separated to record at different sites. After walking for a while in complete darkness, I stopped and set up my equipment with my mics the usual 30 feet or so from where I was sitting. At first, all I heard were the melodious sounds of a wide variety of frogs and the casual whistle of a tinamou, 
a bird common to Central and South American rainforests. Then, much to my surprise, the jaguar that had been apparently following me just off the path made its presence known by literally stepping up to the mic. sound sample came to us from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Macaulay Library, which in fact stores sounds of extinct and threatened species. The Hawaiian O-bird disappeared in about 1983. In about 1981, there were two, a male and a female, that were seen. The female was killed in a storm, and then the male lasted another year or so and was last seen flying off. And, and that was it, and it's an extraordinarily beautiful sound. Greenway, which is a community-led plan 
for a bicycle slash pedestrian greenway along the South Bronx waterfront, which will provide much needed open space, waterfront access, and opportunities for mixed use economic development. Uh, another one is called Green Roof. And uh, Green Roof encourages re roofing of buildings with a layer of soil and foliage. Uh, resulting in temperature reduction, energy conservation, storm water management, improved air quality, and long-term savings, cost savings. And there's and finally, there's a, uh, another program that they're working on, which is called BEST, B-E-S-T, Bronx Environmental Stewardship Training. And this program, which trains a new generation of green-collar workers, was one of the first of its kind in the nation. To date, Sustainable South Bronx has graduated 100 people from the program, right? Good. Sustainable South Bronx and its programs are models of how an organization can create environmental justice solutions via innovative, uh, economically sustainable projects that reflect the needs of the community. Its work has inspired organizations around the country and abroad. Now, Gotham salutes Sustainable South Bronx for its contribution to its community, uh, the environment, and society, and would like to present uh, you with the, the award certificate, which is right here, as well as, um, which uh, Mark had mentioned earlier, um, we have a second certificate to present to you in honor of the Arbor Day Foundation's Rainforest Rescue Program, and as Mark said, the program will save 12,500 square feet of tropical rainforest in the name of Sustainable South Bronx. So you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. yes. um, I'm going to go ahead and set myself up here. Well, unfortunately, I had no idea that I could be as creative as some of the, the music and the sounds that we listen to. So I'm probably going to be um, kind of the least techie of all of us today, but um, I hope what I'll be able to share with you resonates and hopefully is also just as inspirational. So I'm the Executive Director for Sustainable South Bronx, um, and I've been in this lovely role for a little over, not quite a year actually, and I started off as a Deputy Director there, and I think it's really wonderful to, for us as an organization to receive this award, uh, award uh, from a business networking community, largely because uh, my personal background, aside from planning, is business. I actually work for the Bronx Borough President's Office in his economic arm. So I really um, bring a level of, of understanding of business, business needs and the business community to a green organization. So I'm quite honored to, to receive this wonderful award on behalf of SSBX. So I'm starting off with a pop quiz. So I'm interactive. Um, uh, that's my shtick. Uh, so we have, in the United States, 5% of the world's population. That was actually already uh, shown earlier in that lovely video. And we also have 25% of the world's blank. Anyone want to give a guess? Consumption. CO2. CO2. All good, excellent guesses. Money. What was that? Money. Nope. Pollution. All good, good guesses. Incarcerated individuals. Now, you might wonder why is she talking about prisons and people locked up? Well, it's really relevant to the work that we're doing, and actually, I think to all of your work as well, because one of the things we forget um, is the fact that we are resources. And just as we consume a lot of resources, we actually have a lot of amazing ideas. And when we're locked up, when people are locked up, that's a big waste. And in order to really address some of the climate changes that we're experiencing right now, we need to start thinking about people as a resource and not one that should be wasted. So the way we address um, sustainability at SSBX is really trying to start to see the connections. And I really, you know, it's kind of hard to follow some really amazing presenters, especially with all the, the level of dynamic um, information we receive. But it's kind of nice in the sense I can maybe try to pull it together. And I think what we do at SSBX really does that. And this quote, I think, really captures the idea that we're all connected. And you can't really pick one issue without seeing all the other connections it has to the rest of the world. And how we approach uh, sustainability in the South Bronx is really looking at the overlay of the economy, the environment, but not forgetting equity. Because so often, communities are left out. And what we're trying to do in the South Bronx is really to, to change that, but by doing it in a way that creates jobs and also restores an environment that has been left out. 
Um, because oftentimes when we think about the environment, when we think about climate change, it's about polar bears, it's about these resources, and don't get me wrong, those are very important. I'm actually originally from Oregon, so I come from a place where we really value that, and we have good laws that protect it, but I also recognize that without consuming things differently, without changing our practices and habits, we actually trash the very resources we value. And unless we're creating better habits and systems, you know, this is the ultimate result that will, ha um, will, will occur. And you know, it goes into our built environment, how we design buildings, how we design infrastructure, and, and it also could begins like with policy. So this is an image of actually Hunts Point in the South Bronx. This is in the, uh, right after post, uh, World War II. This was a walk to work community, like a lot of neighborhoods throughout the country. This was a place where mom and dad would literally walk to work and kids could play safely in the streets. And this was actually, in Hunts Point, it was a predominantly Italian and Jewish community. And, um, you know, after World War II, as the suburbs became the American dream, you know, folks moved out, and the thing, what is referred to as white fire was happening. And that's, you know, that we can discuss that later, but, you know, it created opportunity for other folks to move in, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but the type of economic development that occurred was a real estate practice known as redlining. So it was, you know, folks were moving up to places like the Bronx and other parts of New York, seeking opportunity, they also didn't have the opportunity because they couldn't invest in it. You know, there was a real estate practice, a business practice known as redlining where, you know, lenders would not actually lend to individuals um, that didn't fit in. So these are the sorts of things, these systemic things that we have to start looking at. Again, there's a lot of things that are connected. And unless we are willing to kind of be open and, and really honest about some of these issues, we're not going to really uh, um, improve the world. So. So the South Bronx got disinvested in. You couldn't buy a house, and as the financial crisis hit, the energy crisis hit, um, it became more economically feasible for building owners to collect insurance um, by letting their buildings burn. And so the, the cliche of, you know, the Bronx is burning and urban blight and communities like the Bronx, it wasn't because people didn't want to take care of their neighborhood. It was actually because, you know, building owners, and it, you know, they wanted to collect insurance money, so they let buildings go into disrepair, and there was actually a habit where they, they hired folks to, to burn down buildings. So the, the psychology that creates in all of us, if you were waking up in the middle of the night, leaving your building because it was burning, or your next, you know, the building next door to you was burning, is something that still affects a lot of communities. That sort of impact that has, um, having fire drills is just a matter of habit, instead of chores or having fire drills. Dressing um, for school the next day just in case you'd have to leave in the middle of the night. These are the sort of things that have still impacted the South Bronx that, that we are working within. And these are the playgrounds. This is, this is the backyard. These are the sounds that people were impacted by. And, and it's really hard to kind of start to think about the global issues if your local issues are so, so challenged and impacted. And what happened with this sort of disinvestment was a new form of investment in the South Bronx, and, and basically it came in the form of waste. So we have a lovely array of waste industries. We have a sewage treatment facility, we have a company that actually pelletizes sewage, we have uh, about 40% of the entire city's waste coming into this uh, community, we have a lot of power plants as well as trucks. We're actually the, the second largest food distribution center in the world. It's right here in New York City, but actually right located in Hunts Point. And all these sorts of things have an impact. It has health impacts. It has a built environment impact. Why would you let your kid run outside if there are 60,000 trucks nearby? So these are all the things that we're trying to tackle. And so our motto is called Green Ghetto. And we really mean to green a community that has been left to, to in a lot of ways, was abandoned by policymakers, abandoned by our government, and in a lot of ways just really mistreated by businesses that weren't thinking like the folks in this room, weren't thinking about how to use their business practices as a way not only to get you know business and clients, but also a way to improve the environment and improve um, the quality of life for future generations.